Perfect. So a few things. Let's kind of talk about what was discussed in your breakout rooms. Hopefully you had enough time to get through a majority of the questions. Um, so first one, uh, what's the thesis, right? Second one, uh, how does the thesis complicate or add to the notion of African-American? Um, and then three, what, what does this information say about the possibilities of African indigenous relations or another way to put that uh, black and brown relations, right? Uh, who would like to share what was discussed in that breakout room? Uh, Patricia, why don't you let us know what was discussed in your breakout room? Well, we kind of focus more on the shared knowledge between the cultures um, prior. Um, we believe, I mean, there's there's a lot of um, proof to show that they that they were that they shared that they were here prior to what is taught in schools, right? Um, and that knowledge, you see the statues, you see um, structures, you see, and I guess we we were focusing more on on past like, like indigenous, like um, you know, Olmec civilization, not so much as the relationship that Black and Browns have now. I, I mean, that's that's kind of what where our focus is more in the history of it, okay. and how um, that's to this day not, it's not taught. Um, yeah. So. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I think, uh, Patricia, I, if you think about it, right, if you take the conversation that you're having, right, and, and the question is not about like, what are black and brown relations today, but what are the possibilities, right? And, and, and think about what you're saying, what you call shared knowledge, which I think is a great way to articulate what was happening. Um, another way to articulate that is cultural confluences, right? It's two opposing cultures coming together to produce one culture that we call the Olmec society, right? So for me, that points to possibilities of these two cultures being able to come together and produce new culture, right? So that, that's, right. And, I, and I think um, although you framed your discussion in the historical happenings of the past, right? Those historical happenings of the past have great implications for what could happen in our future or in our, in our present. Um, who else would like to share uh, what was discussed in their breakout rooms? Patricia, you wanna go Uh, is it Chi or it might be Hazel? I, I don't, I'm not sure, but why don't you share with us what we'll discuss in your breakout rooms? If your technology permits, yeah, Hazel, yeah, could you, are you able to talk? Are you in a space where you could talk? Okay, you're at work, no worries, no worries. Uh, Francesca, why don't you share with us what was discussed in your breakout room? Um, while we, Kind of, um, we're a little bit behind on the reading, so we didn't go as far, but we did got through the first reading. We um, we talked about the biggest movement, which was the Kansas uh, migration movement. Okay. And pretty much we didn't get as more further than that. Okay, no worries. So um, that's kind of situating like what they call the great migration to where um, African peoples who were located in the South migrated North, uh, migrated West and mid Midwest first then to the West um, to escape, you know, racial persecutions and things of that nature. All right, but so let me um, jump into my notes and we'll, I'm gonna use, of course, the textbook as our primary source material, but I'm also gonna use, um, and, I, and I, we talked about this book a little bit last week, um, but I'm going to pull some excerpts from Ivan Van Sertima's They Came Before Columbus, um, which is the book that is referenced in this section of the readings, right? Um, so again, as you know me, I, I like to deal with how things start off. I'm not going to start with the opening paragraph, but the second paragraph, right? The second, the second paragraph starts with thirdly, stress will be placed on African-American as historical actors rather than objects of historical action struggling to define, defend, and develop their interests. 
rather than being opposed on by others. I, I wanna ask, I'm gonna read that one more time and I'm gonna ask you, what does that mean to you, right? So thirdly, stress will be placed on African-Americans as historical actors rather than the objects of historical action, struggling to define, defend and develop their interests rather than being imposed on by others. So he's, he's giving you, um, that's a sentence to speak to the methodology of the, of the section, right? But what is he saying is his methodology about how he will focus on the happenings of African folks? What is that methodology as to what? So in other words, stress will be placed on these people as historical actors. What does that mean to make them as historical actors? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm at work and I was interrupted. I'm so sorry. sorry. It's all good. Um, so the, the, the statement reads, right? Stress will be placed on African people as historical actors. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a historical actor? I'm looking at page 105, um, the first page of chapter four. But just think about it, right? Thank you, Hazel. So if you're looking at the chat, right? Hazel is saying is that they will be the ones that will shape history. Right, so I'm gonna tell this story of African people from the standpoint of them being the ones that are shaping history, not the ones that are subject to how history is being shaped, right? So this is, this is a vast difference in the way that history is being told. And this is a methodology, right? So typically when we hear about historical African phenomenon, they're subjected, right? You're gonna talk about how they were enslaved, you're gonna talk about how they're colonized, right? So all of those type of phenomenon, it places the African people as peripheral, right? Or marginal, right? It doesn't allow them to express or speak to their agency as a people, right? So what Karanga is saying is we're gonna flip that paradigm. We're gonna flip that idea on its head and we're gonna focus on African people as the ones who are producing the action, right? And again, if you think about this, um, it's not too far off of a methodology if you think about African people being the first people on the planet, right? It would make sense that they would be historical actors because they were here first, right? So what Karanga is saying is I'm going to shift this paradigm. And I'm going to focus on these people who we call African and how they impacted the world, not how the world impacted them, okay? Um, let me see here. It says, it thus will not be a litany of lost battles, a dirge of endless defeats or a chronicle of simple survival. So this is not what I'm gonna do, right? I'm not gonna talk about the battles that they lost. I'm not gonna talk about the endless defeats or chronicles simply how they survived. I'm not gonna do that here, right? Um, rather, this section will seek to show black people as they were and are, meeting major challenges with impressive adaptive vitality, durability and achievement. It will show them then not simply surviving, but more importantly, self-consciously developing a process which carries with it both the assumption and the insurance for survival, right? So that last, pair, that last sentence to me is profoundly important as it speaks to what he'll be doing throughout the rest of the chapter, right? And this is why like those, those starting paragraphs are vitally important because they're going to tell you if it's written correctly, right, they're going to tell you what will be happening in the subsequent pages, right? So he's letting you know right? what we will do. We will show them then not as simply surviving, right, but more importantly, self-consciously developing a process which carries with it both the assumption and the insurance for survival, right? So it's not that these happenings are, are, are happenstance, right? So this happened to me, so now I got to come up with something to survive. No, he's talking about we are self-consciously creating these mechanisms that not only allow us to survive, right? But it ensures our survival, right? So again, how things start become very, very important. So going to the next page, and, and he classifies this page as Egypt, Mali and the Olmecs, right? And, and if you think about this from a spatial, remember I, I talked about last week, we have temporal, which is time. We have spatial, which is space, right? So if you think about this from a spatial context, we have Egypt or Kemet, right? On the Eastern part of Africa. We have Mali on the Western part of Africa. And then we have the Olmecs on the Western hemisphere, right? In the United States, Southern Mexico, right? So, 
what's happening here is there's a um there is a migration that's taking place kind of to what Francesca was talking about in the sense of African people moving from the South to, to Kansas, right? To, to look for better opportunities. Um, because of European and Arabic invasion, African people are forced to move out of Egypt or Kemet and start to migrate West and start to migrate South, right? Towards the, the central part of Africa. With that migration, they took their knowledge with them. Right. So a lot of the way that they worshiped and viewed God came along with them on the travel. The importance that they placed on education came along with them on the travel. Right. And it's not happenstance that you have the Temple of Karnak in Kemet, Temple of Karnak, excuse me, in Kemet, which was essentially the Kemetic University system. Right. One of the world's first um, schools of learning this comes out of Kemet. Right. And if you traverse that to Mali, on the western part of, uh, of, the, of the western hemisphere, you have the birth of the University of Sangor, which is the world's first university, right? So the same knowledge, the same information, the same desire that informed the Kemetics to build the Temple of Karnak traveled with them as they migrated west, and they established the same type of um, learning society, this time in the U University of Sangor, right, in Mali. That knowledge, that information, because think about this, right? I said that um, the brother of Mansa Musa, who's out of Mali, right, is Abu Bakar II, who traveled to the Americas 200 years before Columbus, right? So you can't assume that he did not take his cultural influences with him, his religious practices with him, the way that he, they viewed education with him. So this is why you see some of the same type of cultural similarities that you would find in Kemet, in Mali, and in this Olmec civilization. Because when you travel, you take you with you, right? You take your culture, you take your swag, you take all of that with you. You don't leave that behind. And, and one thing about African people, historically, when they travel, they take themselves with them and they set up shop to mimic their cultural understandings, right? And their cultural specificities, right? So looking at, um, Page 106, the opening paragraph for this section, Egypt, Mali, and the Olmecs. It says there is significant evidence that Africans did not come to the Americas first on enslavement ships or as crew members and pilots on European ships, but on their own ships, perhaps as early as 1200 BCE, followed by voyages between 800 and 700 BCE, and again in 1311 and 1312 CE. This is obviously a contested contention, but there is sufficient body of evidence which invites serious consideration. However, if Europeans could reach Americans by, um, sorry, if Europeans could reach America by ancient, why couldn't Africans reach it by design and skill? Excuse me, by accident, excuse me. So if Europeans could reach America by accident, why couldn't Africans reach it by skill, right? Um, Easily the seminal and most um, definitive work on the pres uh, African presence in America is Ivan Van Sertima's They Came Before Columbus. In this major and controversial work, Van Sertima argues not only that Africans were here before Columbus, but they helped build the Olmec civilization, the parent civilization for all subsequent ones in Mesopotamia, right? So again, Africans did not come here solely through the experience of enslavement, right? And he's even saying, um, because in Columbus's own journals that he writes, he talks about that they were African uh, crewmen on a ship that were helping him navigate to the West, right? But Van Sertim is saying like, that's not even how African folks got to the Western hemisphere. We had our own ships, right? In fact, Africa is a nautical culture. Um, talking about um, Kimi, right? What is the main river or body of water that runs through Kemet? Does anyone know? What did you say, Patricia? I think you were right. Is it the Nile? The Nile, right? So I want you guys like to, to imagine this. So in LA, we have what? We have the 10, we have the 105, we have the 405, right? This is the, the means that we move to transport ourselves, right? Via car, we have the freeway. For the Kemetic civilization, the major freeway was the Nile, right? So if the major freeway is the Nile, how are they traversing the Nile? Are they swimming? No. 
right? Are they, are they walking through that shit? No. They're making boats, right? You have to have a boat to be able to travel the Nile, correct? So why is it beyond reason that these boats would be able to traverse the Atlantic, right? If all of your trade and all of your movement is dependent on nautical culture, right, or boating culture, why is it beyond rationale that they would take these very same boats and travel across the Atlantic Ocean, right? But the way that we have been taught history, we can only imagine that Europeans had the technology, skill, and ability to navigate the waters, right? African people have been doing this since the beginning of time. Um, what I want to do, I'm going to kind of transition to Van Sertima's work, because what Karenga does is he kind, of, he kind of covers this in a really broad glance, right? But I want to kind of get to some of the um, cultural confluences that take place that uh, Van Sertima highlights within the text. And, and if we have time, I'll show a quick about 10 minute video of um, Van Sertima himself and some of the archaeological work that he was able to uncover, uh, trying to get some good passages that will kind of speak to um, what I'm talking about. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try this one. Um, so this again, this is from the textbook. Uh, they came before Columbus, which Paranga is pulling from as he gets this information about the African presence here in the Americas. Um, he says, it is with Mexico, however, that we are most concerned for here we can see the confluence of culture to Francesca's point, right? Or sorry, um, I think it might've been Patricia's point. The confluence of culture, not just the confluence of blood, how, um, so he says, we want to focus on the confluence of culture, not just the confluence of blood. So when you talk about a confluence, it's a bringing together, right? So how does the confluence of blood take place? How does that happen? How would two cultures begin to mix their blood? Having sex or what? Say so, yeah, Marcel. Go ahead. Having sex? Yeah, fucking yes. That's how. That's how. That <laughs> works, right? I was gonna say that, but I'm having technical <laughs> difficulty. Yeah, I seen you, Patricia. You went on black. I was like, she got the answer, but she hit the wrong button. But yeah, sex, right? So he's saying, I'm not gonna solely focus on them coming together to make babies, right? Like, yeah, that happens, but to me, that's not as important as how they come together to produce culture, right? So he says, um, when we compare the cult of the werewolf, okay? So the werewolf is the coyote of the prairies, right? So in the Western hemisphere, so let me see, um, in, the, in Africa, right, they have hyenas, right? But in the Western hemisphere, you have coyotes, right? And, and you have um, that shit, the werewolves, right? This is like a more of a Western thing. Right. So check it out. So, you know, in the Americas, you have coyotes and werewolves. Right. Found among the Ateca, Amateca people with the coat of the werewolf, the hyenas of the savanna. Right. Found amongst the Barbara of medieval Mali. We see quite clearly that they are at the very head of the confluence. So what he's saying is in the Mali, there's a whole religious system built around the hyena. OK. But when they travel to the Americas, there is no hyenas, but there's coyotes, right? So what they did is they replaced the hyena with the coyote because this is what's here. And the Olmec culture honors the, 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 the coyote, right? So he's saying like this right here is an example of that cultural confluence. Because think about what I said, when you travel, you bring your customs with you. Naturally, they don't have the hyenas in the Western Hemisphere, so we're going to find that next best thing, coyote, right? And we're going to build a culture around worshiping and giving homage to this coyote, just like the culture that we had back home that gave homage to the hyena, right? It says, there, the werewolf cult among the Bambara, the leading tribe of the Mandingo, was known as the Nama, and the priest or headman of the cult was the Nama Tig Tigi, or the head of the Nama or the Amantigi, the heads of faith. It is a simple jump from Namatigi or Amantigi 
to Amenteca, right? For both Tigi and Teca mean master or chief. So now he's talking about the linguistic confluence, right? How words and language is being usurped and supplemented to support these cultural confluences, right? Because both Amanteca and Amantigi, Amanteca being the indigenous language, right? Amantigi being the African language, they both mean head, master, or chief, right? So again, not only is the cultural confluence from a religious standpoint, it's from a linguistic standpoint, and to Mauricio's standpoint, it's from them coming together to make babies, right? So these are three vastly different um, ways of looking at how African people were able to blend with the indigenous people to produce this culture that we call the, the All Max. Um, I'm gonna move to a little bit further down on the next page, and we're talking about this werewolf god, right? Again, the festival of the werewolf god was celebrated in both cultures, the Mali culture and the Olmec culture, twice a year. In Mali, the god is smeared in blood, usually chicken blood. In Mexico, where human sacrifice was habitual and only slightly mediated by the humanity of the Quetzalcoatl, blood is provided in the first of the two festivals by humans, right? So again, even in their rituals, there's a similarity, right? In Mali, they use chicken blood. In Mexico, where human sacrifice is a little bit more common, they will use human blood, but the principle and the practice was the same, right? The spiritual worship was the same. Um, I'm not gonna go into another example of the language, but let me see, yeah, about, yeah, we have enough time. I'm gonna play a quick little video that details some of the other ways that Ivan Van Sertima was able to prove and authenticate the African presence um, in Central America. Give me one second, let me get that pulled up and we'll share my, I'll share my screen. And, and if you have questions, comments or concerns, feel free to shoot those out. I have a quick question. For the journals, I've been writing them like on a, kind of like on, like this mm. regular pen and paper. Do you, is it okay if I take a picture and like upload it all together or how would you like it for the I, journals. I, I would rather you had um, typed them out just because it'll be easier for me to read, but I don't, I'm not going to make you uh, type all that shit out. So just go ahead and take a picture if you can and, and send it to me um, and try to make it as legible as possible. The picture that is quality as legible as possible. And I, I'll give you credit for that. Um, but typically I, I would like to have that, um, you know, kind of typed out, but it's okay. I'll, I'll let that be cool. I can type it. I mean, I'm a fast typer and it's just right here. I mean, if you want to, I'll, I will take it with you writing it up. I'm not going to punish you like okay. that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So many lectures. Bear with me. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. And you guys see this? All right. <laughs> be close attention to everything that is said tonight and that you should prepare yourself to ask questions about the many troubling problems that beset prehistoric America. It is not really prehistoric, it is merely pre-Spanish, but anything that is pre-European is considered to be prehistoric. It is 
the really critical missing pages of history, both for America and for Africa. And what I want to do tonight, apart from touching on what we have seen within the last day or two at Mitla and at Monte Alban, what I would like to do is to go on to make a summary of what we have achieved, what we have seen, what we have witnessed in the last week in Mexico. We began in Von Wutenow's studio. Make no mistake, there is no studio in the world where you will find such a collection of African physical types in ancient America. Many of you have not had the opportunity to examine closely at leisure all the pieces in that collection. It is a priceless collection. And many of you have raised the question which must be pursued, what will happen when von Wutenow, who is now 84, dies? What will happen to collection which is of tremendous significance for us Blacks throughout the third world? Because the likelihood is, as has happened in previous centuries, the likelihood is that all of these marvelous pieces which we have seen, which we have not yet had time to photograph completely and to preserve, may disappear. Von Wutenow has, in addition to these little sculptures, he has a catalog of everything he has. Brilliant photographs taken by several professionals over the years. She is apparently the director of the dancing group. And this is a man, and his, his features are totonac. They're not Negroid, but they paint them, paint them with chapopote, so it is a warrior who is black. That is also an atavismo because they knew that the Olympics were black. You say that the all black people themselves were black? No. No, but this one certainly was black. You see, you can't see. And here is the proof for it. It's one of the best proofs I have. This is a figure made that is between the Olmec and period and the Totemac and period, transition period. And this is an Olmec sculpture. And to be black, they covered it with tar. You see, it's a stone head, but it's covered with this tar. So not only the features and the thick lips come out, primitive, but it is made black. Yes. This, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, this piece was uh, put on the cover of uh, um, yeah. a vista of, um, in Mexico on March, and uh, shows you that another colossal Olmec head was found in Mexico, which has not been, in my opinion, I, can, I don't know where it is, it's never exhibited. I wonder if they really have excavated it. Of course, you see these, <clears throat> There is an item that uh, the people in Tabasco, the Tabasco is, a, is one of the provinces here, I mean, one of the states, the state, just as Louisiana is a state. Here. And the people in Tabasco don't want it to disappear from their place to uh, Mexico City. And there are frictions between the Institute of Anthropologia and the state, you see. And that's why I don't know if they've done in the States something about it. In any case, it has not been shown up here in Mexico City. But it is 100% Negroid uh, features. And um, I wish we could get it out and get some of you. The choice of archaeological sites to link all that we have seen together as a single piece. This is one of the most difficult things to do in Mexico. There's a vast amount of confusion, even among the guides who are supposed to have mastered the material in their own area. There's a vast amount of confusion about dates, about the occupation of sites, about the nature of influences, about what the various things we have seen mean. Some of these things cannot yet be explained. Some of these things people can only guess at. But what we are certain of, what we are absolutely certain of, is that the Olmec civilization, which is the mother of all American civilizations, 
is not a single stranded civilization. It does not belong to one race. It does not belong to what we conceive of as the Native American who came across the Bering Straits. There obviously were other influences, and among those influences was the African, specifically the Egypto-Nubian of the Mediterranean. When we look in Von Wutenow's studio, we see quite a number of heads, most of them pre-classic. By pre-classic is meant periods between, say, about 1000 BC, going right down to about 600 BC. This is a significant phase in Olmec civilization. There are several phases of the Olmec. I must deal with phases now, and those of you who are taking notes, please note, because you can get very confused when you see the Olmec appearing in other places in later centuries and becoming mixed up with other peoples. This is some of the things that lead to confusion. We must understand that in the capitals of the Olmec world, in the Olmec morning or the morning of that Olmec world, you have people coming into the site, occupying these sites as early as 1200 BC at La Benta, the holy capital, as early as 1500 BC at San Lorenzo. Those dates have nothing to do with the actual sculptures, the actual monuments, etc. People walk into a site and start to occupy it because they find there is land there, there they can uh, plow the fields, they can grow crops, they can eat, etc. They don't just walk in today and tomorrow they start building colossal sculptures and massive ceremonial platforms and pyramids, et cetera. So when people come into a site, has nothing to do with when the flowering, the high point, the climax of the civilization occurs. The Olmecs came into their sites pretty early, as early as 1500 BC at San Lorenzo, as early as 1200 BC at La Venta. You must look carefully at this map and see the diamond points. Those are the capitals. And those diamond points show you where the Olmec first made their major settlements. Now it is as early as 1858 that Mexicans became aware of these sites. Remember that just like in Egypt, a great civilization flourished and then died. And then people forgot all about it. The pyramids lay under the sand, the sphinx lay under the sand. Some things stood there like enigmatic witnesses of a glorious past. But many people continued to live for centuries without recovering the majesty of that civilization, without being able to go back to their roots. This is what happened in many of the great cities of the Americas, that for a long time, for centuries, a shadow fell upon this world. Something very unusual seemed to happen somewhere around 8900. Some people put it slightly later, but something very unusual happened in America. It may have been some kind of cataclysm. It may have been an epidemic. It may have been the upheaval, some revolution in which the elite was overthrown and many of the marvelous statues and many of the marvelous platforms were abandoned. We do not know exactly what happened. It was suggested by Victor Damas at Palenque that there was an epidemic of cholera and that could account for the disappearance of people. And that may be a plausible explanation for the disappearance of some of the people from the Mayan sites. But when we come to the Olmec morning, which I want to dwell upon because it affects everything, when Michael Coe and others speak of the Olmec as the mother of American civilization, they are really stating the whole thing in a sentence. It really is. Because in the Olmec morning, on that great platform at, at the Venta, we find quite a number of things that is to affect the civilization centuries afterwards. But let me come back to 1858. 1858 was the discovery at Tres Zapotes of a stone head. Now, this is the stone head. This is the first head to be discovered. Now, look closely at this head. When the Mexicans saw this head, when their scholars saw this head, scholars like Orozco Ibera, Jose Melgar, etc., they were absolutely convinced 
that there were Africans in America at some ancient time. Why were they convinced? They were convinced by two things, by the African physiognomy, the native Okay, so that kind of gives you um, some sort of ported source material to what I was arguing. Um, also, you know, you kind of got to see Van Sterdeman himself and some of the artifacts that help support his work. Um, so I want to hear a little bit your, about your thoughts about what was talked about today, and then also want to address any questions you all may have about the essays, the prompts, or, or anything of the semester. Um, so what are your thoughts about the African presence prior to uh, Columbus, um, what are your thoughts about the cultural influence, confluence of African culture and indigenous culture? Any of this, curious to hear your thoughts. Well, if you if you go down to Southern Mexico, you you still see a lot of the influence like in Veracruz. Um, and I, I tend to kind of dwell more on history because like you said, it kind of, um, impacted the relationship there is today. Um, I find it interesting myself because, you know, my family is, is from Mexico. I'm first generation here. But if you look at me, I'm totally white with red hair. Like this is not dyed hair. My hair is red. But if you look at my grandmother, she's very in, like an, an Indian. Yeah. And I have a great grandfather who looks black. Mm -hmm. So it, it to me just um and all this it, it, the more you 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 see the history of it how it was here i've asked my my kid and i've asked nieces and nephews when when i say can you tell me something about black history first thing they say is slaves mm -hmm. that's all they know and it's all it's taught and for me, it's just a lot to process and there's just so many aspects of it. Um, and just all the lies and still the, the not. For my, my, my question is, um, what could be done to, to bring this into mainstream teaching? Because it's still, even though the evidence is there, um, for instance, with me, you still have professors saying no, and it's it's it just it, it boggles the mind. I just there's there's so much evidence there, and you know it, it just it's, it's kind of frustrating. And so, what 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 is to be done though now that the uh, evidence is there? I, I think that's a um, to some regret to some regards, Patricia. That's a personal question because, like for me because of my occupation, right? Like it's easy for me to disrupt these notions of making this information available, right? Like that's why I put this in the course. When I cover, even when I teach at Cal State LA, I make sure we cover this topic because although it's a black studies department, not only here in Cerritos, but also at Cal State LA, right? The majority of the folks in the class look like y'all more than they look like me, right? So um, what does that do for the way that the indigenous community views the African community? Right. So for me, this information is important, not because of just history. Right. But hopefully this will allow you all to think differently about how you view black folks. Right. And, and, and not as a, um, a competitor, because because we're in a capitalist system. Right. A lot of the rift between these communities stems from this notion of competition. Right. And the black community will say, well, the indigenous folks are coming in here and taking up our jobs. Not really. Right, but this is the message that they will tell us to keep us divided. Right, um, you'll get the message about black folks that we're a criminal element, that we're lazy. Right, not really, but this is what's right. being told to keep us divided. Right, so what happens when this message starts to become the normative stereotype? What would South LA look like if everyone understood the possibilities of cultural confluence between these two communities? Right, like what are the possible? And that's why I asked the question to start the class. Right, what are the possibilities? Because this is, this is a way for you to process your question about thinking about those possibilities. And, and, and for me, again, that's why I asked that. So I have my way of going about making sure that this information is available, right? Um, but personally, based off of your um, sphere of influence, based off your skills and talents and what you do, how can you make this information available, right? I heard you mention you have a child. 
It's a yes. great way to start changing how we view these two communities, right? Because who knows who your child may grow up to impact or what your child may do in their future that allows them to make this information readily available. So I think it's a profoundly brilliant question, but it's a, 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 it's a personal question. And, and it's a question that um, everyone must look within about their abilities, right? To see how they could address your question. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, other thoughts, other comments, other concerns. Desiree, what you thinking? Um, for me, it's just it goes back to I did this reading because my dad's like really good in history and stuff, and my grandparents, my great great grandparents, are Native Americans, so they tell me all this stuff, and they say like it goes back to like cave um, times when like they cave right. He goes, my grandpa told me like if you go to the caves, you'll see not one white person, you just see colored people. He goes, but you know these white people just still to their mind till this day go off and they think that they were born here first he goes which you know i'm also latina as well so they call us wetbacks and he goes my grandpa goes like they're the ones that came from ships they're they're the ones that have the wetbacks we were here and i'm like grandpa like and he goes no me honey he's like i'm glad you're taking this class i'm glad everyone are doing it he's like but even if you show proof like that video it shows the faces of African Americans, they will still in their mind think it's a white person or they just made it, you know, with bigger lips or something. So it just, it, it's just, it gets me irritated more, like, and I'm more frustrated because how people don't have any knowledge for expanding their knowledge and knowing more about other cultures other than their own. Because like how you said, I think it was in the last club, last Zoom, we started in like this Western you know white history teaching versus it still has not even got changed to this day because the only people I knew were like Martin Luther King you know Rosa Parks all those from modern time not then before yeah, yeah. it had to do with that yeah no and I think you're, you're spot on and I think your grandfather is spot on too right and I think that's why like I always tell um students y'all if y'all have grandparents man sit at their feet and get those stories because that's your history, right? When you're talking about history, that's your history. And they argue that, you know, African history is a very much of an oral tradition, right? And I would argue that most indigenous cultures are oral traditions. So the way to get that oral history is to sit at the feet of your grandparents because they have it, they lived it, right? Because they, by and large, probably sat at the feet of their parents and their grandparents. So these are the ways that you have to maintain your sense of self and your place in the world, right? My my um, my wife is from uh, Eritrea, it's, it's in East Africa, right? And she tells me how like when you were coming up, if you met someone, an elder, they would ask you, whose father are you? Or sorry, who's, who's your father, who's your mother? And you have to run down your mother and father, your grandfather, your great, 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 and you have to trace your lineage back, right? That's how you would meet someone, right? So again, that just regrounds you in your self, sense of self and who you are. Right. And that's embedded into their culture. And we have gotten so far away from that. Um, in fact, because we live in this Western culture, what do we do with old folks? What do we do with them? Put them in home. Put them in home. I see that a lot in the hospital. They don't care for them. How fucking crazy is that? They should be honored. Right. They should be put in a place in your home. Right. But by putting them up on a shelf in these old folks' homes, we're missing out on that knowledge. We're missing out on our legacy, right? It's, to me, it's intentional. It's intentional. They don't want us to know these truths, right? Um, other thoughts? Mauricio, what, what do you think about today's conversation? You know, it's just like she was saying, mind boggling that with some evidence and stuff like that. Cause I think I took that class maybe like 20 years ago about the my um the old mic and all that stuff. And I do remember some of those pictures. So that has been out there for like 20 years since I took that class. And just thinking about like, okay, 20 years later, and they're still kind of like, okay, with that same notion that Columbus still came here first, right. you know? Um, of course it's becoming more like Columbus wasn't here first and he genocide and all this stuff, you know? But it still hasn't changed the fact that, or gotten back to that blacks were here before. Yeah. You know, so it's just kind of like crazy that I, I remember taking that class like 20 years ago, you know, and I remember those images. Yeah. And, and just to fuck you up a little bit more, like 
that book was published in 1976. Okay, that's, that's, that's the year I was born. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, 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 think about that, yo. So it's not even the 20 years that you took the class, right? This book's been out since the 70s. Yeah, so it's 45 years. They don't want to give it space, you know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah it's crazy how nothing has really changed in that time, you know? Yeah. So even with having, having that out there. Yeah. And, and here, to kind of tie your conversation, Mauricio, to Patricia's comment and, or her question, like, what do we do? Um, I don't know what your guys' academic future holds, right? I don't know what your desires are if you're, if you're looking to go into, um, you know, bachelor's, master's, whatever the case may be. But to me, one of the ways that we could kind of up in like this, um, or we could produce what is called subjugated knowledge, right? So this book is what we would call subjugated knowledge. It's a knowledge that the dominant world doesn't want us to know. So it becomes subjugated, right? So way to up in that is to get people like us into the spaces of higher education, right? So not only can we bring this type of subjugated knowledge to the fore, we could write and produce subjugated knowledge, right? This is the way that we upend this static telling of history. And, and being in PhD programs and being in these spaces, by and large, folks are sick of the old dead white men, right? So we have to bring new thoughts and new people into these spaces to kind of replace those voices. Right. Um, I pride myself for my dissertation. I have no white thinkers as source material on my dissertation. Not not a one, not one. And that's intentional. Right. I seek to disrupt the static telling of history, the static telling of how who can possess knowledge right? or whose knowledge is validated. Right. There's a whole world of information that indigenous and African people possess that just because their skin isn't white, we don't you don't want to hear it. Right. So I think as scholars, as intellectual and as critical beings, right, as spiritual beings, right, it becomes our job to bring us into these spaces. Right. Um, if we had more time in the semester, I typically give students this uh, task or this assignment. Does anybody know, does anyone know what code switching is or does anyone not know what code switching is? Anyone unfamiliar with the term? Code? Okay. So code switching is like, um, so say, take me for example, right? Like there's what you call Ebonics and then there's like standard American English, right? So one of the things that black folks have to do to be able to fit in professional spaces is leave the Ebonics off the table and speak in standard American vernacular English, right? That's a code switch. You're switching your code from your normal self to be professional. Right for my um, bilingual people in the course, right? You code switch without even knowing it. So maybe at home you'll speak Spanish, but when you go to work or out in public, you leave that Spanish at home and you'll speak English. So you're code switching to fit the environment around you, right? Oftentimes you code switch to fit the environment is another way of just saying you're performing whiteness, right? And correct me if I'm wrong. How many teachers have y'all had that talk like me? Not many, right? And for me, this is a purposeful pedagogical practice, right? To show you anyone could occupy this space. There's not a specific mold that you have to fit. There's not a certain way that you have to talk to sound educated. Be yourself. My information and my knowledge speaks for itself. Can you tell me that I'm not able to properly educate you on this subject matter? Nah. I'm doing it in a term, in a language that's I'm comfortable with and you're able to understand. So I'm refusing to code switch, right? So typically what I'll have you all do is in a space where you normally code switch to perform whiteness, don't do it. But I'll tell you, don't get fired or don't get your ass whooped, right? But do it in a way that you can experiment with being yourself in spaces where you don't always feel comfortable in being yourself, right? And that's important. Because what does that say about how you value yourself if you feel you need to be someone else to occupy a space? That's implicit self-devaluation. And it's all cultural because what is professional is whiteness. What is unprofessional? Anything but whiteness, right? There's a, I don't know if you ever heard of, it started off in New York and it became a federal law. It's called the Crown Act. Does that sound familiar to anyone? So the Crown Act says that African people are allowed to wear their hair in its natural state in workspaces. 
because people would get kicked out of work, get kicked out of school for wearing braids, uh, wearing dreadlocks, right? Um, ethnic hair would be deemed inappropriate, right? So they had to pass a whole law to say that you could be your authentic self as it pertains to your hair in your workspace, right? So again, to me, at a deeper level, it's really about valuing who you are and being at peace and understanding the divinity in your true authentic self and being uncomfortable enough in your divinity to take that everywhere you go, right? Um, you don't have to dim your light for nobody, in other words, right? Whether that be cultural, whether that be spiritual, whether that be intellectual, right? You don't have to dim your light to make someone else feel com comfortable. And the way that whiteness orients itself, it makes others feel smaller so it could feel good. I say, fuck that. You're gonna have to adjust to me in my space, right? If you're uncomfortable with the way that I get down, that's on you. You need to fix that, not me, right? Because I'm just being my authentic self. And this is something that I try to instill in everyone that I come into contact with. Because your authentic, pure, divine self is perfect, just as it is. And that's what the world needs to see, right? Um, for sake of time, anyone have questions about their, their essays or their prompts or anything of that nature? The journals, anything? Okay, go ahead, Desiree. Um, my question was for about like my essay, I was talking, I wanted to talk about the medical field, but there wasn't so many, yeah. um, like, you know, examples. So I switched it to like how our learning is and how it was in the sixties and like, cause we had more examples. Is that fine? But I was going to ask also too, if I could add another thing as well or no. Yeah, I, I'm fine with that. I just don't want you to get overwhelmed, right? Like it's only, and, and keep in mind, you only have four to five pages. Um, you might run through those pages really quick. You know what I mean? So that, that would be my only um, caution I would offer to you is just like, don't take on something that's so overwhelming that you don't have enough space to write it. You know what I mean? And then um, for your own personal research, because I know you're into like uh, medical um, equal equity and things of that nature. There's a book by Henrietta, Henrietta Washington. It's called Medical Apartheid. And it talks about how the segregation, if you will, or the bifurcation or the inequity in the medical field. And it's a, it's a really good text, medical apartheid. Yeah, okay, thank mm -hmm. you. I have one question. Go ahead, Marisha. I, I also saw that um, there's a, when's the last due date? I think I saw the 24th of the essay, but there's also something due on the 30th. I'm gonna, um, I, I, the essay for the 24th, I'm gonna push that back because we actually have one more week of the of the semester. So you'll have more time to work on your essay. Then I was actually, when I get done here, I'm gonna adjust that due date. Um, for the 30th, I'll look, um, because the only thing else that will be due outside the essay would be your journals. And those will be due on the same time. So when you submit your essay, just turn in your journal also. So that should be done at the same day. So to be more accurate for you all, uh, and, and I'm gonna put this on Canvas, but I believe, we have until the second, I'm oh, sorry, the, uh, the first of July would be Friday. So I'm gonna ask for like the um, essay by the 30th. So that, that will be the due date for your essay and for your journal will be June 30th. And I'll go and make an announcement as soon as we get off the line today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, for the sources, do we have to use the textbook or can we use outside sources? You could absolutely use outside sources. Um, I just say the textbook because it's, it's easier, right? Like you, you have already covered material from the textbook. So I just thought that would be easier, but you could definitely use outside sources. Just make sure that they're academic, right? Yeah, like my mind, so I was going to talk about police brutality. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, I have like, I have gathered outside information already. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Go ahead, that's right. Um, it wasn't a question, but just I do know how you were talking about like ethnic self and stuff in the medical field now. We're um we're not allowed to like hide our tattoos anymore. Hmm. So I know a lot of because how you were saying like white stuff. We anyone who had tattoos, they had to get, have it covered up, yeah. regardless of where it was. So now that we're allowed to have tattoos being shown. People, a lot of, I want to just say whites, don't like it and they would refuse for us to mm. take care of them. And I'm like, okay, at this point, like I can save your life, but if you don't want my help, it's fine because I have tattoos <laughs> on my wrist. Right. Yeah. I, and um, there is a doctor we do have, and 
full sleeves, like full everything. And when they say they don't take them, you know, like professional. But yeah, now we're allowed to not show our tattoos. Yeah. Like and we could show them. That that is interesting because for me, like if I'm sick, whoever can help me, help me. I don't care what you look like. You shit, you could be green. If you could get me better, get get me better. Like that's foolish to say, oh, I'm not gonna take your help because you like what? Especially like tattoos are so proliferated now, like it's not even a big deal. You know what I mean? So, and I think too, that's also a kind of a generational barrier. You know what I mean? Like older people just not comfortable with those things. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Okay. So um, next week will be our last Zoom. Um, like I said, as soon as we hit the end button, I'm going to go and adjust the due date for the final essay. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, shoot me an email or a message. I'll be happy to um, correspond to you. And if need be, we'll set up a Zoom um, to get those details ironed out. Um, try not to stress, right? Just keep in mind it's three, four to five pages. Like don't, don't stress yourself out too much for it. I'm only looking for you to work through the problem or the question. If you do that, it's an eight paper. You know what I mean? I'm not going to put too much more on it than that. Um, all right, y'all. Be healthy, be wealthy, be wise. Get your exercise, vitamin D, and water. And I will see you next week. Peace. Bye, Professor. Thank you. Have a good one, Desiree. Marisa, you got a question? No, I was just like, see you, Professor. Have a good one, yeah, man. Take care, man. Right, Hazel, have a good one. All right, Patricia.